This is an audiobook for The Inspirational Spear-Wielding Hero, a Kirby fanfiction written by Fireboy. Text version and timestamps in the description. Chapter Zero, A Fateful Encounter Ah, screw this garbage! I scream out as my last ounce of fighting spirit left my body and I threw my rusty broadsword to the ground. Two dark beast-like figures with long sharp claws stood across from me. I could theoretically take them out, but I knew that they would just be replaced. This war had been going on for months, or maybe even a year at this point. We aren't sure where these things came from, but as soon as they showed up, the king forced anyone who had any idea how to hold a weapon into this. I was sick of it. I was sick of fighting a never-ending battle. I was sick of watching my friends disappear, and I was sick of having to hold on to the hope that this battle would one day be over. So if these two wanted to end my life, I would at least not have to witness the end of this world with my own eyes. One of the figures rushes towards me, claws at the ready, making an aim to finish me off. I close my eyes and wait. But instead of claws piercing flesh, what was heard was the sound of metal rubbing together. I open my eyes and see the beast's claws wrapped around the metal tip of a spear. What are you doing just standing around for? The voice from the base of the spear exclaims. I've seen this guy before. He's from the batch of new recruits where I thought I'd all died. He's relatively young and weak, especially compared to the other recruits. All of this in addition to his short stature doesn't come off as inspiring confidence. Nevertheless, there he is, continuing to fight after I, who had more physical capabilities, had given up. He had somehow managed to push back the beast momentarily and I was able to get a better look at him. In the time since I'd last seen him, he has added a blue bandana wrapped around his head to his outfit and tied a small piece of red fabric to his military-issued spear. Even though he was weak, he seemed determined to stand out from the rest of the recruits to avoid meeting their same end. Why are you continuing to fight? I scream in a raspy voice. Don't you understand that you're only delaying the inevitable and causing yourself more pain by keeping this up? The two beasts regroup and ran in to attack him from both sides. He avoided a fatal blow, but just barely. Through his pain, he responds to my plea to stop. Even if everything in this chaotic world seems hopeless, or maybe because this world is so chaotic, there is still always a chance that hope could return, but that chance will never come if you just give up. His words came off as illogical to me. How could someone so weak still have so much passion to even humor this fight, let alone try to win it? It makes no sense. However, looking at him continue to fight back despite his injuries and weak build, I can't help but admire him. I found myself wanting him to succeed. His dedication to never give up is a mentality I want to be able to survive, even if this world doesn't. Without putting any more thought into it, I stood up and grabbed my sword off the ground and returned to the fight. After making quick work of the beast, I turned to the spear-wielding hero and proclaimed, If this world is so chaotic that it started a war in a single day, then maybe it could just as easily swing in the opposite direction, towards a truly peaceful world. In that case, maybe your way of thinking could be beneficial. So I'm going to fight and live to see the end of this stupid war. Chapter 1. The Start of a New Day Thump. I startled myself awake after falling out of the bed and hitting the floor. Not an unusual way to wake up, but still not particularly pleasant. I suppose that's why I bought this carpet. I pushed myself off the floor and go over to the window. It wasn't even fully sunrise yet. The light from the sun was just barely peeking out from behind the green spring mountains, giving everything a very faint glow. I can't believe it's only been a year. I whisper to myself in disbelief. Looking at this peaceful scenery, you wouldn't guess that up until a year ago it was the scene of a battlefield. Soon after I met that guy, a mysterious warrior appeared from the stars who then found and defeated the leader of that army. Just like that, all of the dark creatures vanished. The king was furious that his army was useless in the war and how the one who ended it was an outsider. Because of this, he forced anyone who survived to teach the next generation how to fight. As inexperienced as I am in teaching, the included room and board is not a bad deal. Speaking of which, it's not starting for a while, but I should get ready for breakfast. It's not like I have anything else to do in the meantime. I threw on my usual outfit of an off-white sweatshirt and a pair of sweatpants. Because this is mainly a military school, outside of special events, I don't need anything fancy, but I obviously need to look presentable. Speaking of which, I probably need to do something with my hair and whatnot. After I finish getting ready, I grab my shoulder bag with the things I need for the day, including some textbooks, a foldable umbrella, and a novel filled with various folklore. I also grab a light jacket. Even though it's already spring, it's still pretty cold out. The addition of the gray jacket to my outfit made it look a little too monotone, but my black hair kind of balances it out. Not that it really matters anyway. I then left the room heading down the hall. The empty hallways are another sign of how early it is. I got to the end of the hall and reached the elevators. Seeing as the dorm building is seven stories high, going from the top where the teacher's rooms are to the second without an elevator would be a pain in the arse. After I reach the end of my ride, I wander over to the cafeteria. The cafeteria itself isn't massive, but it is big enough to fit the 60 students, 25 teachers, and 15 staff members who live here. And just as I thought, it was empty with the only signs of life coming from the kitchen. So I decide to sit down at one of the empty tables and catch up on some light reading. What are you doing here? I hear a friendly voice call out. 
I look up from my book to see the guy who effectively saved my life still wearing that blue bandana waving at me with both hands from across the room. Hey Bandy, I'm just killing some time with the book. Bandy is a nickname that I decided to use after we met, due to his signature bandana. He then walks over to the table I'm sitting at. I can see that. I meant what are you doing here so early? He asked with a slight giggle. Oh, I woke up early and didn't feel like going back to sleep, so I came down here to see if there was anything to do. I give him a concise reply. Then do you mind if I join you? Sure, no problem. I put the book back in my bag as Bandy sits down next to me and we begin chatting. In the time since our first encounter, we have sort of become best friends. Well, maybe best friends isn't the best way to describe our relationship, since best implies that there are multiple things competing for that. He's just the only one I've met so far who hasn't died or ran away. What are you thinking about? His voice jumps out to me as I realize I'd zoned out of our conversation. Oh, sorry, it's nothing. I say not wanting to worry him. It has only been a year since the war ended. He sees through my obvious lie. I break eye contact and let out a small sigh in the form of a chuckle. Heh. <laughs> After all this time, I still haven't been able to talk to anyone other than you. I lost everybody else. I let out dejectedly. You shouldn't blame everything on your circumstances, because despite that, you could still be doing more to make friends. He says to me with a hint of sternness in his voice. Bandy is definitely the friendliest person I met, but even he is no stranger to calling me out on my shortcomings. Yeah, I know. It's not like I'm complaining per se. I have you to talk to, and it's not like I particularly dislike being by myself. I say trying to take his philosophy to heart and look on the bright side of things. You should still try to make more of an effort to make friends with your co-workers. If you have spare time anyway, you have nothing to lose, he suggests. Do you have a problem with the current way that I'm living my life? That came off a little more curt than I would have liked, but it still made my point. Not at all! I'm just saying that you shouldn't close off any possibilities because you're happy with your current way of life. It could still get better. Besides, it's not like I'm winning any popularity contests myself, but I still do my best to get people to like me. As he said that, I realized that his philosophy wasn't only a way of thinking, but actions needed to be taken based off of it. Or perhaps his philosophy is to aim for the best life that you can achieve? Or maybe he's just saying that I should carefully consider all of my options? Uh, yeah, I guess. I quickly blurt out, realizing that I'm getting lost in thought again. Bandy then gives out a smile, as if to assure that there were no hard feelings in his advice, and I attempt the same. Bandy wants to make friends for the goal of being popular and general acceptance by the people around him, while I want to make friends simply out of boredom. In the end, we both have the goal of wanting more friends, so I know he just wants what's best for me. As our conversation was reaching its conclusion, the cafeteria starts to fill up with hungry students and teachers. Due to us being the first ones to get there, when the food starts to get handed out, Bandy and I were first in line. Getting your food is a pretty simple process. You use an ID card on the machine near the entrance of the cafeteria, then it spits out a tray for your food. Breakfast was an omelette, a rice ball, a small salad, and a choice of orange or apple juice. I picked the orange and Bandy went for the apple juice. Not a surprise, I see him drinking that stuff almost every time I see him. We then find an open table and sit down across from each other. As we eat, I continue to think of solutions and roadblocks to my friend's problem. Now that I think about it, my main problem is that I don't know anyone's names, but we've been working together for a couple of months now, so asking at this point would be awkward, I think out loud. Also, I just don't have the ability to approach people for no reason. That one is definitely your fault, Bandy replies with a chuckle. But I might just see a solution. Bandy points over my shoulder. I look over to see one of the new teachers that started just the other day. She's a girl with a bright yellow scarf and long black hair. Actually, now that I'm looking at it, her hair almost looks a bit purple under direct lighting. The rest of her outfit is pretty standard, with a brown purse, black blouse, and a white dress and shoes. She's currently standing in front of the ID machine with a confused look on her face and hitting seemingly random buttons on it. Her? How is she going to help? She can't even work the ID machine, I raise my brow at Bandy. Make friends with her, he replies as if that's the obvious conclusion. You can approach her with the guise of helping her with the machine, and she's new enough that you shouldn't have learned her name by now. Eh, she doesn't really look like the type of person I would get along well with, and I'm sure she'll figure it out eventually. Bandy gives me a glare that I've never seen from him before. It's the kind of look a parent would make after catching their child stealing from the cookie jar. Fine, I just need to learn her name, right? Bandy gives me a smile and a nod as I get out of my seat and walk over to the confused teacher. You need to put your ID card in before it'll do anything, I say as she jumps up and turns to face me. Oh, is that what this thing is for? She asks while pulling her ID card out from her purse. Yeah, it's also used for doing laundry on the fourth floor and accessing the gym on the third. I see, what a useful little card. She says while staring at the card in her hand with awe. Now that I get a closer look, she is pretty cute, but that's not important right now. So anyway, I return to the matter at hand. If you put your card into the machine and pull the lever on the side, it'll give you a tray that you can put your food on. I see. Okay, let's try it, she says with determination. She puts the ID card in and pulls the lever, and just as I said, it shoots out a tray. Oh, there we go. Now I can finally eat, she announces celebrating her victory. Thank you so much for your help. 
You're the swordsmanship teacher, aren't you? Yeah, and you teach, uh, magic, right? Yes, that is correct, she says with a reassuring smile. My name is Flanira. It's nice to meet you. That's kind of a strange name, I say as I wouldn't even have the first clue on how to spell that. Yeah, I know, it's kind of hard to remember, she admits with a slight giggle. So if you want, you can call me Scarfy. Is that because of the scarf? I ask already knowing the answer. Exactly, she confirms. I overheard you and your friend talking and I thought his nickname was cute, so I wanted one of my own. She says with a smile before getting more timid. I I hope you don't mind. Not at all. It works out well, I say already forgetting her real name. <sighs> That's good, she says with a relieved sigh. Oh, I need to hurry or I'm not going to have enough time to finish my food. I'll see you later. See you, I call out as she's leaving earshot. I walk back over to Bandy, who has a very smug look on his face. I got her name. I hope you're happy. I am, and it looked like it didn't go too bad, he holds his smug smile. Yeah, but I forgot to give her my name. Well, there's always a next time, Bandy says, trying to cheer me up. Yeah, I guess you're right. Today is far from over, so I suppose there is a next time. Chapter 2. Being a Teacher Bandy and I finish our breakfast and head down to the lobby on the first floor. Seeing as everybody lives here, there's not many people going in and out, but it does get a few uses. For example, it's where the ingredients for the cafeteria food gets delivered, and there is a small reception desk for the few visitors we do get. But its main use is housing the two exits out of the building. The one on the east side takes you to the main road that leads to the nearby town. I usually go to the town on the weekends for shopping and killing time, but today, Bandy and I need to do our job, so we head to the west exit that leads to the school. We walk out the door and are slapped in the face with cool winds, sounds of students chatting, and an explosion of lush green trees and blue skies. Wow, another beautiful day today, Bandy says while holding onto his bandana, trying not to let the wind steal it. Yeah, and it's a little warmer today, too, I say while walking ahead, brushing the hair out of my face. Although with those clouds in the distance, it looks like it's gonna rain later. Bandy skips to catch up. All the more reason to enjoy it before it's over. Always the optimistic one, aren't you? I say in a sarcastic tone. The walkway connecting the dorms and the school is about a 10 minute walk, but it's actually pretty enjoyable thanks to the trees lining the walkway. While they're depressing in the winter, most of the time they have vivid lush leaves that are quite pretty. There are also cheery students that litter the path who often give me a wave hello. Looking off into the distance, to the left of the path, past some rolling hills, I can see the town and the king's castle on an overlooking mountain. You know, I used to hate the king, I think out loud. He forced me to fight in that stupid war and then threw this job at me when it was over. Bandy ponders for a second then responds. I think he has good intentions though. He wanted as many people fighting as possible to protect the ones who couldn't. Also, this job has pretty good benefits, like lodging and food. It also serves as a good opportunity to think about what we want to do with our lives after the war. Is this just Bandy's optimism or does he have some sort of admiration for the king? Hmm, I say out loud. I suppose, but I'm still unsure if the ends justify the means in this case. A lot of people did die in that war. Yeah, but I don't think the king made that decision lightly. And it seems like this school was made specifically to help people fight and prevent something like that from happening again. Now I'm convinced that he has a thing for the king. You seem to be singing his praises a whole lot. Yeah, but I think someone strong like that who can make tough decisions is important to have in this world, Bandy explains. To be truthful, after we are done teaching, I was thinking of joining his royal guard in hopes of learning some of that strength. Bandy is always wanting to become stronger, so I guess that's what this is all about. Fair enough, I smirk. Bandy and I arrive at the school. It's not very big. The 60 students are split into age groups of 15 each and are placed into one of the four grades for each year. The students we get are aged around 11 to 15, so the split works out to group students of similar skills together, for the most part. The students stick to one room while we are based in a common room with the rest of the teachers and follow a schedule to go around and teach our subjects. For example, I teach swords, Bandy teaches spears, and Scarfy teaches magic. There are also a few general education classes. Because of this, the classrooms are modeled after dojos, but also have desks for more traditional studying. Bandy and I head to the teacher's room. The teacher's room is roughly the size of one of the classrooms, with 15 desks lined across the room for the teachers and the principal's desk at the back of the room overlooking the rest. On the wall behind the principal's desk is a glass display case filled with several different types of weapons. It's kind of out of place, but we use wooden weapons in classes and in practice, so I guess the principal has those on display so the students have an idea of what the real things look like. As we enter the teacher's room, the principal looks up from her desk. Good morning, she yells from across the room. Good morning, Bandy and I calmly reply, being well used to this type of greeting. The principal can be pretty strict, but because she does everything with such a chipper attitude, it softens the blow during the times where she pushes extra work on you. On the way to my desk, Scarfy notices me and gives me a wave hello. 
I wave back, still unsure exactly what our relationship is. I suppose that she doesn't have many friends either, and is just happy to see a somewhat familiar face. Bandy and I head over to our two desks in the corner of the room and gather the things we need to teach our classes. The practice swords and other training equipment are already in the classrooms, so the only thing we need is a list of what we need to teach the students and have them practice. Okay, I'm ready. How about you? I ask Bandy. Yep, good luck today, Bandy replies cheerfully. You too. We then head off to our first class. I'm teaching the first years, and Bandy is teaching the third years. I sort of prefer teaching the younger grades, as they are pretty friendly and chipper. I obviously don't dislike the older kids, but I have noticed that as the kids get older, they get more serious and standoffish, so it's kind of more difficult to relax while teaching them. But on the other hand, the older kids can handle more complex lessons, so I have more freedom to get creative when I teach them, so whatever. As I get to the first year classroom, I see them casually sprawled out on the floor, chatting with each other while waiting for class to begin. I wonder if it's really okay for someone like me to be teaching kids swordsmanship. As I look at their happy faces, that sense of uncertainty washes over me again. After all, I am only one step away from being a war criminal. How could I help lead the next generation into a truly peaceful world, let alone with swords? These things only bring death and suffering. I shake these thoughts out of my head for the moment and start the class. The principal would be furious if I was late starting a class, and I don't feel like dealing with that at the moment. After the lesson, I head back to the teacher's room and sit down at my desk to prepare for my next class. At least I try to, but those thoughts from earlier continue to itch at the back of my head. There's that expression again. I look up from my desk to see Bandy walking towards me. What do you mean? I've known you long enough to know when there's something on your mind, so spill it. Bandy has always been inquisitive to those around him, so I suppose it's no surprise that he would notice this. Well... I let out a sigh. I was just wondering if these kids really need to learn how to use things like swords and spears. If the school wants to foster a truly peaceful world, like you say, wouldn't it be more useful to focus on general education or things like farming? That's kind of a bleak way of looking at things, Bandy says with a bit of shock in his voice. He then ponders for a second, then continues. While it is true that most of these kids probably won't need these skills, the act of learning them has merit by itself. What do you mean? Well, learning how to master something like a sword or a spear takes a lot of time and dedication, and that knowledge is transferable. With those skills, they can learn anything they want. Exactly! The principal screams as she walks up from behind us and interrupts Bandy. Why do you think we take in kids so young? She continues. These classes will form the fundamental building blocks that these children can use throughout their entire lives. Bandy nods in agreement. Yeah, and the confidence that they can protect themselves on the off chance something does happen is an added plus. I guess that makes sense, I reply. Anyway, the principal riles back up. Get back to work. You both have classes to teach. Yes, ma'am. Bandy and I both reply and hurry to gather our things and head out. After my morning classes, I gather my things and prepare to go to lunch. Do you want to head to lunch together? I turn and ask Bandy. I'm sorry. He puts his hands together in apology. The principal wants me to deliver this month's report to the castle. Oh yeah, that thing. Every month, someone needs to make a trip into town to deliver a monthly report to the castle to inform the king how our school is doing. It takes all afternoon to get there and back, so we usually have to draw straws to decide who goes. But this month, Bandy volunteered to do it. I forgot that was today. No problem, I don't mind eating lunch alone. I try not to make him feel like he's abandoning me. Okay, I'll be back in time for dinner though, Bandy assures and then runs off with a wave. I wave back as he disappears through the door. Afterwards, I leave the school and head back to the residential building. It's kind of a pain in the butt to have to go all the way back there for food, but it's a nice day today, so I don't mind. I arrive at the cafeteria to collect my food. Lunch is a hamburger, an apple, and a milk carton. This time, when I pull the lever on the ID machine, it gives me a box instead of a tray. I suppose it's for making the lunch portable? You know what? I might as well. I grab my food and head outside. Right next to the footpath, there's a flat, grassy area that people often use for eating when the weather is nice. I find a spot and sit down to start eating. Hello there, sword teacher. Didn't expect to see you here. I look up and see Scarfy smiling at me, holding a box of food of her own. Oh, hello. I wasn't expecting you either, I reply with an awkward half-giggle. Do you mind if I join you for lunch? She gestures to the empty space next to me. Uh, sure, no problem. I didn't mean to say um out loud. Yay! She sits down and starts opening her food. By the way, I don't think I ever got your name. Oh yeah, she's right. She told me her name, but I never gave her my own. Well, my real name is kind of embarrassing, so it's not something I want to advertise all over the place. You know what? You can keep calling me Sword Teacher if you want. It's what all the kids call me. She giggles, then replies, Sword Teacher it is, then. We then begin eating our food. I'm actually kind of surprised that she's so nice. The students talk about her in hushed whispers. Apparently she's supposed to be really strict and scary. Maybe she's only that way around them? Or perhaps she's just putting on a front right now? Why are you staring at me? Do I have something on my face? She notices my zone out. 
Oh, uh, no. I blurred out avoiding eye contact. That was embarrassing. I didn't mean to stare. I was just thinking about something. Really? What is it? I'm still kind of worried about how she'll react to this question, but I am dying of curiosity. Well, I was just thinking that you seem like a nice person, but the students think that you're scary. Oh no, do they really think that? Scarfy's head drops down. That's just the sort of impression I get from them, but I don't know if they're telling the truth. You know how kids can be. I say feeling remorse for making this cute girl sad. No, I think you're right, she replies. I get pretty nervous teaching an entire room full of students, and I get worried that they won't listen to me, so I have a habit of overcompensating and coming off too strict. Oh, I see, I say as I crack a smile. I see, it's not a problem of her being two-faced, she's just having issues teaching. Kind of silly now that I think about it. Yeah, I was pretty nervous when I first started teaching too, but after a while I realized that the students are generally good people, so as long as you smile and act friendly towards them, they'll listen to what you say most of the time. I say trying to give some advice. Is that so? Her head lifts up. Then maybe I just need to wait for them to warm up to me. Yeah, I give a reassuring smile. Scarfy and I continue chatting and finish our lunch. Oh, I forgot I still need to prepare for my next class. She jumps up. Can you return my box to the cafeteria for me? Sure, no problem, I reply while taking your box. See you later. See you! She waves as she runs off towards the school. Now that I'm getting to know her better, I realize that my initial impression of her was wrong. She's not so incompetent that she can't work out an ID machine, nor is she a jerk teacher. She's just a girl that's doing her best for the cards that she was dealt. Kind of like me in a way. Actually, we're all kind of like that at this school. Chapter 3. The Will to Survive After lunch, I head back over to the school and teach my afternoon classes. Near the end of the day, Bandy finally comes back. Yo, how'd it go? I look up from my desk and greet him as he walks into the teacher's room. Went off without a hitch. Just a lot of walking. Well, at least you got some exercise. Yeah, that's good at least. Anyway, the day's over, so gather your things and let's head to dinner. Bandy walks over to his desk and gathers his things. We then leave the teacher's room, saying goodbye to the principal who's still organizing papers at her desk. We stop right before the main entrance to the school and glance out the window next to it. So, it's raining. I shrug as I pull out the umbrella from my bag. I then look over at Bandy, who has pulled out a blue and white striped parasol with light blue polka dots decorating it and a star ornament on the tip of it. Um, isn't that a parasol? That thing's not going to do you much good in this rain, I say glaring. Oh, but it's not an ordinary parasol. He gets a boastful look on his face while holding the parasol above his head. It's reinforced with magic fabric, so it's powerful enough to block most projectiles, even some direct attacks. So rain is no issue for it. Pretty neat, huh? Yeah, sounds real neat. Where'd you get it? I used up my spare money to buy it from a shop near the castle. Apparently it's the same type of parasol that the king's royal guard uses. A magic parasol that can block attacks and is used to protect the king. I express my disbelief. Are you sure you didn't get scammed? Probably not. He opens his parasol and walks outside. It seems to protect me from the rain though. I open my umbrella and follow him outside. At least it matches your bandana. We make our way back to the dorm building and head to the cafeteria for dinner. Food this time is curry and rice with the milk. They also have meat buns for anyone still hungry afterwards. Bandy haggles with one of the workers to get his milk replaced with an apple juice left over from this morning. We find an empty table and sit down to begin eating. Hello again! I look up to see Scarfy with a tray of food. Oh, hey there, what's up? I casually reply. Not much! She smiles back. I then see Bandy with an expectant look on his face. Oh yeah, that's right, they've never met. I look back to Scarfy. This here's my friend. It's nice to meet you! My name's Flaneria, but you can call me Scarfy if you want. She smiles. It's nice to meet you, too. You can call me Bandy if you want. He smiles back and they both share a giggle. She sits down and the three of us begin chatting and eating our food. Bandy and Scarfy are both so cheery that it's no surprise that they would get along so quickly. So you teach magic, right? Bandy asks. I don't know much about it. Do you mind explaining how it works? Oh, not at all, Scarfy replies eagerly. It's pretty simple, actually. Every living being in this world has a certain amount of energy within it, and by using something as a medium, one can manifest this energy into the physical world. This is most commonly done using an enchanted book to summon spells, like a fireball attack, for example. Can you use other types of objects, like a spear, for example? Bandy asks, hopefully. Of course, she replies. If you do that, you can enchant the weapon to enhance its abilities. For example, you can use magic to move it much faster than usual, or even change its size and shape if you're skilled enough. There are even stories about an organization on a distant planet that uses this magic to transform ordinary swords into powerful weapons that they use to protect the peace. Sure sounds complicated, I interject, trying not to let her go on forever about folklore. She's clearly the type that likes to geek out over stuff like this. Oh, it's not really as complicated as I'm making it out to be, she calms down. Wow, I wonder if I could do that one day, Bandy replies with stars in his eyes. We then finish up our food and leave the cafeteria, each grabbing a meat bun on the way out. 
So, what are your plans for the rest of the evening? Scarfy asks. I'm gonna train, of course, Bandy enthusiastically replies. Me too, let's go together. Sure, sounds like a plan. What about you? Bandy looks over in my direction. I want to go change and do some laundry, but after I'll probably join. We wave each other off as Bandy and Scarfy head up the stairs to the gym, and I enter the elevator to the top floor. When I reach my room, I drop off my bag and change into a blue jersey and basketball shorts. I grab my laundry basket and practice sword and head back to the elevator. After reaching the laundry rooms on the fourth floor, I find a machine. I throw my laundry in it and present my ID to start the wash. These things are washer and dryer hybrids, which is convenient, but they take like three hours to do it. Whatever, should give me plenty of time to train. I leave my basket and take my practice sword and leave the room, heading down the stairs to the gym. I present my ID badge to the door and it swings open to the gym. The gym itself is one big room that takes up the entire floor and is currently filled with students and teachers practicing all kinds of combat techniques. I give the room a glance and immediately see Scarfy, who is holding some sort of book and shooting ice, fire, and lightning at some wooden targets. Sure looks fancy, I carefully come up from behind her to avoid getting shot. Oh, hello! She closes her book and turns to me. It is pretty fancy, isn't it? I can also use wind magic to jump around really fast, but it's a little dangerous to use inside. I laugh at what I hope was a joke. When she first started working here, I heard rumors that, despite being slightly younger than me, she was on the front lines during the war, so it's no surprise that she's so adept at using magic this way. So anyway, do you know where Bandy went? I interject into the conversation. Oh, he's at the other end of the gym practicing some new technique. New technique? Yeah, he said something about getting inspired to learn how to fly. Fly? I raise my brow at this crazy sounding idea. Now this I gotta see. Okay, see you around. We wave as we part ways. Halfway across the gym, I'm nearly blown off my feet by a gust of wind. I look over to see the principal sparring with an exhausted looking teacher. Is that all you got? I'm holding back as much as I can and you can't even get one hit on me? I hear her yell at the now cowarding teacher. The principal uses magic on iron gauntlets to increase the speed and power of her punches. That, in combination to her already impressive physical strength, leads to attacks that resemble lightning strikes rather than actual punches, which was the cause of that shockwave from earlier. I definitely know she was on the front lines during the war. A full-powered punch from her could take down half an army in one blow. She is by far the strongest person at this school, if not the whole kingdom. Well, I hear that the king himself is pretty strong when he gets serious. Actually, I hear the two are good friends. Her strength, in combination with the trust the king has in her, is probably half the reason she got the job of principal. I'm almost blown off my feet by another shockwave and decide it's best to not stick around for longer. I make it to the other end of the gym and see Bandy spinning his trusty spear above his head. What are you doing? I ask in a slightly judgmental tone. Oh hi, I'm just working on a new secret move that's going to help me fly through the sky, he proudly claims. How is spinning around a stick going to help you fly, I question. Do you remember when Scarfy explained that you can use magic to enhance weapons and make them move faster? Well, in theory, I could use that to spin my spear super fast in order to create a downdraft strong enough to let me fly. I take a second to process what he just said and respond. That is one of the most insane things I have ever heard. Hey, if the principal can use magic to punch faster, then why won't I be able to do something similar, he replies. Because the principal is one of the best magic users in the kingdom, I remind him. Can you even use any magic, let alone enough to spin your spear the 250 rotations per minute it would require for any kind of height? Eh, uh, not really. His head drops down. Now I feel bad. As improbable as I think his idea is, I didn't mean to make him sad. Well, who knows. When magic is involved, with enough training, maybe something like that might be possible one day. I tell him with a slight smile. Yeah, you're right. He jumps up with his enthusiasm fully returned. I just have to keep training and become strong. Then anything can become possible. I give him a slight smile before looking out into the crowd of people in the gym. Everybody here is training and getting as strong as they can, but for what end? Will it even make a difference? What's wrong? You look sad. Bandy's voice interrupts my thoughts. Well, I think for a moment before continuing. Everyone here is training to become stronger, but we were completely outmatched in the war. How's a few more months or even years of training going to help? Well, Bandy begins his reply struggling for the right words. You're right, if something like that happens again, there's not much we can do to stop it with our current power. Did I finally get him to admit defeat? However, of course not, I think everybody is doing their best to live their lives, hoping that something like that won't happen again. But why though, I ask. I know when I first met you, I acknowledged the fact that the world could change for the better at any time. However, that doesn't change the fact that we are living in a world where horrible things can happen at any time, evidenced by the fact that plenty of them have happened before. Bandy thinks again before replying. Yeah, I guess people just find ways to not worry too much about stuff like that. Yeah, I guess, I shrug. Not a very satisfactory answer out of him. How can you just not think about something like that? But this conversation is starting to get depressing, so let's try to change the topic. 
Anyway, if we do want to live tomorrow, then we best get back to training. Yeah. Bandy then goes back to twirling his spear as I leave to find some empty space in the gym to start practicing sword swings. After over two hours of swinging my wooden sword, the soreness in my arms starts to become sincerely uncomfortable. Bandy left not too long ago to sleep, and Scarfy disappeared somewhere too. I suppose I could go see if my laundry's ready. I then leave the gym and head upstairs to the laundry room. Nah, the machine still has a few more minutes left on it. Oh, hello, what are you doing here so late? I hear a friendly voice call out. I look up from the timer on the machine to see Scarfy entering the room, waving at me with one hand while holding a basket with the other. Oh, just finishing up my laundry. I see. I'm trying to do a quick load of laundry myself. She says as she walks over and starts putting her clothes into the wash. I was planning on doing it in the morning, but the principal has errands to run in town tomorrow, so she wants me to come in early to make sure the school day starts off smoothly. Sounds like a pain. Oh no, not at all. I actually volunteered to do it. I'm still pretty new, so I thought it'd be a good way to learn how the school works. She replied with her usual smile. Well, it still sucks that you have to stay up late, seeing as these things take forever to clean your clothes, I say sympathetically. Actually, why can't we just have these things use magic to run faster? Scarfy stops filling the machine and gives me her full attention. Well, that is due to the fact that non-living things can't produce magic by themselves. The most you can do is imbue its parts with magic to fortify or give it special properties. I'm actually kind of curious about some things involving magic, so I guess I'll indulge her on her obsession. What exactly is so unique about living things that lets them produce magic? Well, actually, she takes another step close to me. That is a debated topic with experts. Nobody's really sure where this magic comes from. However, most people agree that whatever produces this magic is kind of like an invisible muscle, seeing as how after using too much magic, the body becomes tired. And furthermore, after long-term use of magic, one can build up this muscle to use more and more magic before becoming tired. I see. I awkwardly take a step back as she's getting a little too close for comfort. Then someone like me who has never used magic in the past probably can't do much. Not at all! If you combine magic with your expert skills in swordsplay, then even you can do magic. Like what? Like the legendary sword beam, she exclaims. If you simply focus on building up power in your sword, you can imbue it with magic, then release that magic with a swing to fire a projectile. Sounds pretty sick. Yes, it is indeed sick. However, you need a lot of focus in order to build up this power. So if you have something like an injury distracting you, it'll be difficult. Speaking of injuries, I break eye contact. Can magic be used to heal those? Scarfy's excitement dies down while she ponders for a bit before responding. Yes, to an extent. However, living things are quite complex, so even healing a little cut can take a lot of magic. She then realizes why I'm asking this question. I'm sorry. With the level of magic a mortal can reach, healing a fatal wound is impossible, let alone bringing back someone from the dead. All of the friends we lost in that war are long gone. A brief period of silence fills the room. Oh, I'm sorry for being such a downer, Scarfy jumps up. Oh, don't worry about it. I wasn't expecting magic to be all-powerful. I say feeling bad I made this cute girl sad twice in one day. Okay, she says relieved. Besides, magic is already pretty useful as is. A buzzer on the machine interrupts our conversation. Anyway, I still gotta put away my clothes and take a shower before bed, so I'll see you tomorrow. I throw my clean clothes back in my basket. Okay, see you tomorrow, sword teacher. She then gives me a smile and a wave as I head out of the room. Chapter 4, The End of Today after a long day, I finally get back to my room, folded and put away my laundry, took a shower, and made it to my bed. And yet, I can't sleep at all. As I lie there on the bed, staring at the ceiling, I can't help but to think of everything that's happened today. First of all, I met Scarfy. She's so friendly and easy to talk to, I forgot that until this morning she was a complete stranger. I suppose I'm glad that Bandy pushed me into talking to her, because I would have never done so otherwise. Before I met her, I assumed she wasn't someone I would enjoy talking to, let alone someone who would enjoy talking to me. Maybe she's just desperate for friends and I'm the first one who talked to her? She does seem like the type of person who is friendly towards everyone, but I'd still like to imagine that she's particularly nice to me. Not that I'm even the type of person who deserves that kind of treatment. Now that I think about it, it is kind of weird that I've pretty much gotten used to this kind of life. Just over a year ago, I was fighting for my life, killing creatures I didn't understand without a second thought. After the war, I held on to the hope that we could create a perfectly peaceful world, but terrible things can and still happen, so I'm starting to doubt if that could even happen. Also, should I even be a teacher? The point of being a teacher is to pass on some sort of wisdom on to the next generation. Then is my depressing mindset something that should live on? Furthermore, should I have friends, let alone ones who are so nice to me? I feel like most of the time, I'm just holding them back. But I would be lying if I said I didn't enjoy having them. Maybe I'm just selfish. The friend I feel most guilty having is Bandy. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have made it out of that battlefield alive. Ever since then, he's made it easier to get out of bed every morning. I wonder why he keeps hanging around me. He's so optimistic and cheerful. I wonder what he gets out of hanging around a sad sack like me all day. Maybe he just wants to help me see things from his perspective and cheer me up? 
That sounds a little too selfless, even for him. Whatever the reason, being friends with an optimistic guy like that does fill me with a comforting sense of happiness. You know, we've already been friends for over a year, so I wonder if our relationship could progress any further if I could ever get my act together. But I don't know if a guy like him could ever end up with a girl like me. All of these thoughts start to make my head spin, so I do my best to push him out of my mind for the moment and try to sleep. Chapter 5. Tomorrow Light slowly begins to fill the room as my eyes open to a familiar ceiling. I suppose I did eventually fall asleep last night. I then get out of my bed and stare at the foggy morning mountains out of my window. Not wanting to be late for breakfast, I then begin to get ready, putting on my usual outfit, brushing my teeth, and lightly brushing my hair. You know, it kind of got in the way yesterday, so I should put it up today. I then grab a rubber band from my drawer and tie my shoulder-length hair up in a ponytail. Before leaving the room, I find myself sighing into my mirror. I'm supposed to be the strong and respected sword teacher, but I feel like it's hard to inspire that kind of confidence in my students with such a round and weak-looking face. Realizing that there's nothing to be done about that, I then grab my bag and jacket, then leave the room. After reaching the cafeteria, I meet up with Bandy. Good morning, he smiles at me. Oh, uh, good morning, I avoid eye contact. Something wrong? Don't worry about it, it's nothing. I just have a lot on my mind. So, the usual? Bandy smiles as we head over to get our breakfast. Breakfast today was a bagel, banana, another salad, and a choice of an orange and apple juice. This time I followed Bandy in getting the apple juice. This juice isn't bad, but what makes you drink it every day, I inquire. To become stronger, of course, Bandy replies as if that could be the only answer. If you drink it every day, then you can become stronger too. I don't think that's how apple juice works, but if I can gain more power, then I suppose it's worth a shot, I suggest while sipping on the juice. Bandy and I finish our breakfast and head down to the west exit. Today is another warm spring day, only slightly undercut by the slight fog that fills the pathway to the school. So, what are your plans for today? I ask Bandy, trying to kill some time with some small talk. Well, I only have a few classes today, so I was thinking of working on future lesson plans. I think there's a way to explain the spear thrust that's easier to understand. I see. I'm bad at anticipating how students are going to understand things, so most of the time I just play it by ear. Bandy giggles, then responds. I suppose there's merit to doing things that way as well. Suddenly, our conversation is interrupted by a loud sound in the distance. As soon as I heard it, an uncomfortable, surreal feeling overtook me. I haven't heard this sound for a while, and I wasn't expecting to hear it here of all places. But there was no doubt in my mind as to what that sound was. An explosion. As soon as I realized what was happening, my legs started to run me down the path towards the school, zigzagging past groups of bewildered students. Before I knew it, I had reached the school building, which to my demise was missing a chunk of wall and had a tower of black smoke rising from it. Before I can even react to what I stumbled across, I notice a figure in the distance standing on a small hill. He looks like some sort of knight wearing white armor with gold and pink highlights. But the most notable thing about him is his angelic-looking wings sprouting from his back. He's also holding a white shield and a pink lance that's about the length of a short sword. His whole outfit would look comishly garish if it wasn't for the fact that his lance sword is coated in a thin layer of blood. Furthermore, even from this distance, I can clearly see the thirst for battle in his eyes. Now that I think about it, I recognize this guy from a book I was reading the other day. According to folklore, he's known as the greatest warrior in the galaxy, and was sealed away in fear of his power. If that's true, then what is he doing here? I then realize that he has to be the one responsible for the attack on the school, but as soon as that thought turns into anger and I try to approach the knight, a fireball is launched towards him, hitting him and dispelling into smoke. I look towards the source of that attack and see Scarfy holding her magic book with her black shirt splotched with blood. Is that you, sword teacher? What are you doing here? But, before I can answer her question, she interrupts. You have to get out of here! We don't even know what this guy can do! I look back over to the knight, who despite taking a direct hit is unscathed. He then opens his wings and flies towards Scarfy, with his lance pointed at her neck. Right before contact, she points at the ground and shoots out a gust of wind that pushes her backwards in time to dodge the attack. She uses the space to shoot several more fireballs before having to jump back again to dodge another stab. After watching this repeat a few times, I realize that there's nothing I can do and run inside the school. As soon as I enter the school, I stomp the ground out of frustration. Damn it! There has to be something I can do. After all this time, I can't be this weak. If only I had a weapon. I then remember the display case in the teacher's room. They may be only for display, but they are real weapons. I run over to the room and grab a chair to break open the case. I grab a broadsword and run back outside. As soon as I catch sight of the knight again, I scream at him as loud as I can. Leave my friend alone, you bastard! Despite my best efforts to distract him, he doesn't even flinch at my shout, keeping his eyes focused on Scarfy. He then disappears, but it's not his speed, he must be using some sort of magic to teleport. He then reappears in front of Scarfy and pierces her stomach. He then leaves Scarfy in a pool of her blood to fall to the ground. Damn you! I lose my composure and run over to Scarfy. Quite the persistent one, aren't you? I'm stopped in my tracks by a voice that shakes me to my very core. 
It sounds threatening and dismissive at the same time, like a lion that has cornered its prey. I look over to discover that the voice is coming from the knight, whose eyes are now locked on me. I was going to let you live, since you're so weak, but if you're going to continue to get in the way of my fights, then I'll have to remove you. The knight then swings his lance in the air, creating a tear in the space in front of him. Before I can even comprehend what he just did, a mass of pink energy spews from the tear and forms into a laser headed straight for me. The laser is too massive for me to have any hope of dodging it in time. As soon as the laser is supposed to hit me, it's deflected away. I look up to see Bandy standing in front of me with his spear strapped to his back and holding his blue parasol, using it as a shield to block the beam. After the laser completely disappears, he turns to me with a reassuring smile. Sorry I'm late, I had to go pick up a few things. But on the plus side, now we know this thing actually works. I never thought that he could find a way to save my life twice, but here we are. Thanks for the save. I try to let out a chuckle, but I'm still shaking from the fear. Bandy, on the other hand, while obviously also scared, is still firmly holding his ground. Our attention is then snapped back over to the knight who lets out a laugh. Ha! Maybe between the two of you I could find a decent challenge out of this. We keep our eyes locked on him, desperately trying to think of a way out of this alive. But first, I need to find a way to check on Scarfy. Bandy, how long do you think you can survive while keeping that guy distracted? As long as he doesn't pull out anything too crazy, probably a minute or two. Okay, I'm gonna make a break for Scarfy. Got it. I then make a dash for the place where Scarfy fell, while Bandy pulls out his spear and starts running in the opposite direction, circling the knight. Hey jerk, if you want to fight, then I got one right here. The knight takes the bait, then begins firing lightning strikes from the tip of his lance towards Bandy. I make it over to Scarfy, only to be horrified by what I find. The area surrounding her stab wound is now completely dyed red, and she's coughing up blood. Hang in there, it'll be okay, I shout as I throw off my jacket and press it against her wound. I don't know about that one. She looks up at me with hazy eyes. Looking at where I got stabbed and how much blood I'm coughing up, I have to guess that I have a fair amount of internal bleeding. Then why are you so calm? I desperately start thinking of things I could do to help. We could find something in the school to stop the bleeding, or use magic. I'm sorry, she replies. I've gone through every scenario that I could think of in my head, and I only see this ending one way. So there's no reason to make it any more painful than it needs to be. No! I scream my mind blank. I can't lose you too. You're one of the only friends I have here, and I've only met you yesterday. There's still so many things I want to share with you. Scarfy gives off a slight smile. I'm glad to have become someone that you are sad to see go away. As soon as she says that, a memory comes flooding back to me of when I first met Bandy. The reason I decided to live in this cruel world was because I was holding on to the belief that one day it would turn into a truly happy and peaceful one. I was getting discouraged that it was seeming impossible, but now I think such a black and white way of viewing the world doesn't make sense. Even though I'm losing a precious friend, at the same time, I'm happy that I was able to make a friend like this in the first place. I think I get it now, I look up at the foggy morning sky. Even though this world will never truly be peaceful, and even though this world is so harsh that it starts wars and kills people for no reason, it's still worth living in, because despite all of the ugliness, good things can happen in it, like creating precious friendships like the one I made with you. It's all a matter of what aspect of this world you decide to focus on. I'm glad that, despite everything that's happened to you, you still decide to look on the bright side, she replies in a weak voice. Hey, can I ask a favor of you? Anything, I reply softly. She then briefly lifts her head off the ground long enough to take off her scarf and hand it to me. Can you hold on to this for me? It's a present from my parents, and I don't want anything to happen to it. Sure, I'll take good care of it. But I'm not really the scarf-wearing kind of girl. She giggles. I think for a second. How about this, then? I take the scarf and tie it around my right arm over the sleeve of my sweatshirt. How's that look? It goes well with your black hair, she smiles again. Can I ask one more question? Yes. Do you mind giving me your real name? I let out a small chuckle. She's been trying to get that ever since I met her. I suppose now's a good time to tell her. It's Tsurugi. Like the alternate reading for the Japanese kanji for sword? She asks. That's cute. Yeah, it's an embarrassing present from my parents. They were kind of big nerds when it came to swords. I see, so that's why you're so good at sword play for your age. She smiles, obviously happy having learned this about me. I then notice the light in her eyes begin to fade and realize I don't have much time. Scarfy, I look her directly in the eyes. I promise you that I'll never give up looking for the good in this world, no matter what happens in it. She then looks back at me and smiles. I'm glad to have met you, Sudugi. Thank you. She then slowly closes her eyes and stops moving. I then stand up and face the knight, who is still firing at the now exhausted Bandi. All feelings of sorrow I felt have now been turned into rage. I pick back up my sword and start walking towards the fight. Bandi finds an opening and runs up to me. How's Scarfy? he asks. I ignore him and point my sword at the knight. You killed my friend, you monster! I scream at him, letting out all the emotions bubbling up inside of me. 
Upon hearing this news, Bandy is left stunned. The knight looks back at me. It's unfortunate that happened, but it can't be helped because- SHUT UP! I interrupt him. I don't care what the reasons are. Murder is unequivocally wrong. I suppose it's only best to show you your place. He then raises his lance and prepares another lightning strike. I then turn to Bandy. How long do you think that parasol can hold out for? Uh, not long. Probably a minute at most. Good enough. Cover me until I give the signal. I have a plan. He then runs out in front of me and starts to block the knight's attack. I then hold up my sword in the air and try to focus. If what Scarfy said last night is true, and the sword beam only works when you don't have any injuries, then it's best used as an opening attack. However, seeing as how strong this guy is, I doubt that I'll live long enough to get any more attacks in, so I better make this count. I then start to focus on my sword, trying to make it as powerful as I can. Soon, I feel my energy leaving my body and my sword starts to glow. A moment later, I start to feel lightheaded, and my vision starts to blur. I suppose this is my limit. NOW! I yell at Bandy as he jumps out of the way. I then swing down my sword as hard as possible, aiming at the knight. As I swing, a cluster of light leaves my sword and starts rushing toward him. With a loud explosion sound, the attack hits him dead center as I collapse to the ground. But unfortunately, when the dust cloud dissipates, the knight is still standing there, unscathed. He then looks at me, now visually annoyed. Is that really the best you have? Damn it! Despite our best efforts between the three of us, we couldn't even scratch him. I then drag myself to my feet and draw my sword while Bandy does the same with his spear. Foolish! The knight lets out while swinging his sword with such a force that it creates a tornado for a brief moment. The force of this clears out the fog from the sky and breaks our weapons clean in half before blowing us back several meters. By the time I regained my bearings, the knight had opened his wings and begun flying toward us, lance at the ready. Without a weapon to defend myself or energy to run, there's nothing I can do. Well, at least I didn't give up this time. Right before the knight makes contact, an object appears before me and stops the attack. I look up to see the principal blocking the sword stab with an armored punch. She then lets out another punch and knocks the knight back. What happened? The principal looks at me, her usual energy replaced with somber determination. This guy appeared out of nowhere and started attacking the school, and then... I advert my eyes as I struggle to finish that sentence. The principal looks around at the rubble of the school and sees Scarfy. I see. The principal then starts walking over the knight. So you think you can come into my school and make a mess of the place? Not on my watch, she declares. Now this is unexpected, the knight calmly replies. Judging from how relieved those two look, it seems like you're the most powerful one here. Let's see what you can do. He then opens his wings to engage the principal in combat. They are both so fast I can barely keep up with my eyes, and their blows are so powerful that each time one of them blocks an attack, a shockwave is released that shakes the ground. It makes me feel stupid for even thinking that I had any hope of fighting someone so powerful. In terms of physical strength, the principal and the knight are evenly matched. However, I can tell that the knight is starting to wear her out. They've only been fighting for a minute or two, but the principal's movements are getting slower, and the knight's not letting up. With the last of her strength, she leaps high into the air and comes down with a punch so powerful that it's more accurate to describe it like a meteor. After getting hit with the principal's meteor, the knight is blown backwards and knocked onto the ground. All three of us let out a sigh of relief. Are you two okay? The principal asks. I'm still catching my breath, so Bandy replies. Yeah, we're okay, just a few scrapes. But then an eerie cackling is heard in the distance. We look over to see the knight back on his feet with only a small crack in his helmet. Pathetic! Is that all you got? The knight screams. The exhausted principal prepares for another round with this invincible demon, but he puts away his weapons and turns his back to us. If you really are the strongest one here, then I'm not going to waste another moment of my time here. It's obvious to me that this planet is so weak it's not even worth destroying. Then, in one flap of his wings, he soars to the sky and disappears without a trace. The three of us are stunned, unable to believe that the battle ended just like that, after all that's happened. After a moment of silence, I then begin to hear whispering. I look around to see students who had gathered to witness the end of that battle and shaking in fear at the overwhelming power they had just seen. I'll calm them down, the principal says in a stern voice, then walks over to the students. I find the energy to stand up and make my way over to her. No, I grab her on the shoulder. What kind of teacher would I be if I couldn't calm my students down after something like this? Okay. She cracks a smile and turns around. I then make my way over to the group of students and find a pile of rubble to stand on. I then take a deep breath and put on my teacher face. Okay, students, listen up. They immediately quiet down and look at me. Now slightly nervous, I take another deep breath and continue. As you just saw, we live in a cruel and harsh world. A world where wars can start for no reason and where you could die at any moment. Now, you can let that fear build up inside of you until it eventually ends you, or you can fight. Because despite all the crap the world can throw at you, there's still so much to love about it. Rather that be something simple like a delicious glass of apple juice, or something more like a good friend that cares deeply about you. There is a countless amount of good in this world. 
There might even be something so beautiful that we can't even comprehend it right now. If you feel fear or sadness now, that just means you haven't given up yet, because you still have something now that you don't want to lose, and that you still believe that good things can happen again. So don't give up. Don't simply try to ignore all the ugliness in this world. Face it head on. Fight through it, because the darkness in this world is never going to go away. But if you know how to fight it, then you can reach the light on the other side. I look out into the crowd of students and see hope returning to their young eyes. I spoke from the very core of my being, so I'm glad something I said got through to them. I then get down from the rubble and collapse in the grass. That was some speech! I open my eyes to see Bandy staring over me, smiling. Well, it's only natural for a teacher of my caliber. He giggles at my response then replies, Are you ready to put your money where your mouth is and help clean up this mess? Of course, I confidently answer. He then takes my hand and pulls me up to my feet as we both head towards tomorrow. The end. Yo, it's the afterword. I hope you enjoyed my first real piece of fiction writing. I enjoy writing in general, and I've been exposed to countless stories, so making something like this is always something I've wanted to do. But the reason I haven't until now is because all the ideas I had were always too big in scope for what I felt my abilities are at, considering the fact that I've never done fiction writing before this. So I thought a fun little fanfic centered on my favorite Kirby character would be the best way to practice. And because I wrote this mainly for writing practice, I want as much feedback on it as possible, so please be as harsh and as critical as possible in the comments. Specifically, I'm curious about if you thought the characters are likable and believable, if you understood the main themes of the story, if you saw the plot twist coming, and if you enjoyed the story as a whole. And of course, anything else you have to say is also welcome. I can't improve if I don't change anything. I also want to give some shoutouts, first to Digibro for releasing his light novel he wrote, and being the main motivating factor to get me to just jump in and start writing. Shoutouts to Uvlakar for letting me bounce ideas off of him and also giving me the idea for Scarfy's real name. And shoutouts to my mom, who actually read a rough draft of this and gave me some feedback. But that's about it. I had a lot of fun writing this, so if I think of any more ideas in the future, I'll probably write them and make them into a video like this. But in the meantime, I want to get back to analytical writing, like my top 10 anime of 2019 video that will be out soon. But until next time, bye!